<laughs> Where was I? Oh, three, two. Now, quadratic functions do fall under this title, polynomial functions. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> He's just smiling back there, making nervous. You don't seem very tight. I was looking at my cell phone. Ah. <laughs> so, a polynomial function. Did I ever show you the general polynomial in here? Maybe not. Maybe I should start simple. No, let, let me at least. <laughs> we got too much time. Too much time. Um. Let's say we talked about a cubic. We would write ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. That would be a cubic function. That would be the degree is 3. What if the degree was 10? I would use a, b, c, d, e. Ah, but I can't use e. There's a reason I can't use e. We'll talk about that in chapter 4. So you can use a, b, c, d. You can't use f because that's a function name. Um, a, C, D, E, F. G you can't use because that's a function name. So that leaves you four so far. H is a function name. I you can't use because it's an imaginary number. J you can't use because it's a vector. What comes after J? K. K is also a vector, so you can't use that. You could use M, N. O is kind of pointless because it looks like zero. Oh, and L. So right now we are up to... Seven letters that we can use. We need 11, and we're already halfway through the alphabet. Yeah. So the problem is, what if I go up to 26 degree? That would be 27 terms. I don't have enough letters already. I'm already using one for X, and I can't use a bunch of the others of the alphabet. So there's got to be a better way of representing a polynomial of any degree, any length. And the way you do that is to say, well... If the degree is x to the n, where n is any natural whole number, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, whatever, then the coefficient I'd really like to call it a. But eventually that would lead the next one to be b, and then I'd run out of letters. So I'm going to call this one a sub n. You remember x sub 1 and x sub 2 and y sub 1 and y sub 2? This is very similar. This is a sub number. So a sub 1 is different than a sub 2, which is different than a sub 3. Or they could be exactly the same. It really doesn't matter. Then when you write your next term in your polynomial, notice this one went from x cubed to x squared. So if I start at x to the n, the next one is going to be x to the... Mm. Now think about it. It goes from 3 to 2 to 1. What am I doing to the power as I move along? The... By how much? 1. one. So it becomes n minus 1. So if n was 5, this one would be 4, right? If n was 5, this would be 4. And then the coefficient would be a sub n minus 1. So the power becomes the sub number. The power becomes the sub number. And we can go to the next one. It would be x to the n minus 2. two. And then this would be a n minus 2 as a sub. So a sub, n minus, a sub n minus 2, x to the n minus 2 power. And we can do this for quite a long time. Until we get down to a sub 2, x squared, a sub 1, x, plus a sub 0. Now this is the general polynomial form. It represents any degree polynomial. It could be 100, and this would represent a sub 100, x to the 100th, a sub... 99, x to the 99, so forth and so on. So that's what's called the general polynomial. General polynomial. I probably spelled that wrong. Function. I want two. My name has two L's. I love my double letters. Kill. Especially on the final. <sighs> Fine, I'll get rid of one L. <laughs> Be quiet. I was having fun. I was having fun. I was having fun. Leave me alone. All right. So technically, that's pointless. 
to even know. I mean, it's got some features that later on you'd have to prove that if you add two polynomials together, you get a polynomial, things like that. For this chapter, the only things you're concerned about is the first one and the last one, a sub n and a sub 0. We'll get to that, I think it's in section 4. For this section, though, these curves, all polynomial functions, have graphs that are smooth, not a very mathematical term, but um, I'll describe it quickly, and continuous. I can't price precisely define continuous for you without calculus, so you're just going to have to go with a little gut feeling on both of these ideas. Let's talk about smooth first. Would you consider this graph smooth? Would you like to ride this roller coaster? <laughs> Heck no. That would not be a smooth curve. This thing is going up and down way too much in a very short period of time. Would this be considered a smooth curve? In other words, would you ride that roller coaster? Smooth. In other words, as you move across it, you're not getting jerked anywhere. Mm -hmm. eh, I wouldn't ride this one because you'd probably be launched and <laughs> die someplace over there. And if you did make that turn, you'd all die. Because you're instantaneously changing from a positive direction to a negative. negative and you're all your break and all oh, your gosh. bones would be dead. So that's kind of what smooth is talking about. Smooth is rolling hill. A roller coaster, basically. Continuous means once you put your pencil down, you never ever pick your pencil up again until you're done finishing the graph. And generally, these graphs have arrows on the end of it, so they never finish. But you never pick up your pencil while you're drawing it. The calculus definition is a little bit trickier, but this will work for our purposes. So you don't get these weird points on the graph. These are called cusps. And you have to keep it as continuous as possible. So all polynomial functions have smooth and continuous for all real numbers, for the entire number line. Okay. The other part of it is um, end behavior. So let's look at two families of graphs. These basically describe the end behavior of all polynomial functions, x squared and x cubed. My black marker is now dying. Let's see. Oh, too far. Too short. I'm left-handed, though. <laughs> the basic graph of x squared and the basic graph of x cubed. What does x squared look like? A u. A u. And it pretty much has an origin point. It goes up this way and up that way. x cubed? Yes. S goes up this way, comes down that way. Now, when we're talking about end behavior, we're not interested in what's happening near the origin. We're interested in as x goes to negative infinity or um, positive infinity. So we're interested in just this part of the graph, where the arrows are. So I'm not really worried about what's happening between those two arrows. I just want to talk about they're both going up. Or in the cube case, one's going down and the other one is going up. The up-up pattern is for even polys. In other words, if the degree of the polynomial is even, the n on the polynomial is even, then your end behavior is either both up or both down, kind of like if it's positive or negative. The down-up version is for odd polynomials. If you graphed x to the 4th, x to the 6th, x to the 8th, they generally look like x squared. If you graphed x, x cubed, x to the 5th, they generally look like x cubed. So that would be their end behavior. 
Um, so a theorem. We haven't seen a theorem here yet. This is a very minor one. If f of x is of degree n, then the n behavior is determined. So then x In other words, it's only determined by the first term of the polynomial. So you could have this huge, ugly polynomial, and all you concentrate on is the first term. How much room have I got? Yeah, enough. Two minutes. Real quick problems. Really? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Real quick problem. Here's my polynomial. Question number one. What is its degree? One. No. If I multiplied it all out, it has to look like a regular old polynomial. Ax squared bx plus c type thing. So if I multiplied this out, what would be the highest power of x? Cubed, right? It would be x times x times x, and you'd get x cubed in it. It would be 1x cubed. So the lead coefficient is 1x cubed. Generally, you don't care about the 1. You only care about if it's positive or negative. In this case, it's positive. So the end behavior is going to be up on the right, down on the left. That's the end behavior of an x cubed function. Second question, what are the x-intercepts? Negative 2, 3, negative 4. So I can draw a sketch of this thing. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Plot my x intercepts. Negative 2, negative 4, positive 3. There's my x intercepts. And I know the end behavior. It's down on the left, so the graph after it passes negative 4, it's going to go down forever. After it passes positive 3, it's going to go up forever. And it does something in the middle. Now, what it does in the middle, it has to be a roller coaster. Smooth and continuous between those two arrows. How it behaves at each one of these points is literally how it would behave if you just graph that. How do you graph x plus 2? What is it? <coughs> y equals x plus 2, what is it? If I was going to ask you to graph y equals x plus 2, how would you graph it? I'm really worried. <laughs> y <coughs> equals x plus 2, how would you graph it? Isn't this on the next test? Nope. Graphing a line? <laughs> yes. Uh, y equals mx plus b. What's its slope? 1. Y intercept? 2. What's the graph look like? Positive. What does the graph look like? It's a line. It's a line. Thank you. Wow. So, when I get close to negative 2 here, the graph is going to look like a line. It's just going to go through it, just like a line. And when I get close to negative 4, it's going to go through like a line. When it gets close to negative 3, it's going to go through like, well, positive 3. It's going to go like a line. So as the graph comes up, it's got to go through this point. Because it's going to behave linearly really, really close to that point. But can I keep going up forever? Mm -hmm. No, because eventually I have to come back and turn around and hit this point. When I turn, it can't be instantaneous. You can't have jagged changes. It's got to be smooth and... Continuous, so it goes down. But eventually it's going to have to come back up. So it's going to go down, turn around nice and smoothly, and eventually head up in that direction. And there's your graph. That, that function generally looks like that picture.
And we'll finish that on Wednesday after the test. So, study, 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 study. Watch my videos. Watch my short videos. Not the long ones, the short ones. You get to watch the long ones. But everybody else gets to watch the short ones. If you want to do that extra credit, it's on my website too. This question on the next test. Seriously, this is probably the simplest part of this end behavior stuff. What's that? Five of them? And then if you don't know how to do anything. But the funny thing is, people miss them all the time. I don't know why. Maybe it's because it's graphing. So if you have an even polynomial, your general end behavior is either both up or both down. So x to the fourth, x to the sixth, x to the eighth. If that's the lead polynomial, the highest degree of the polynomial, that would be the general odd behavior. This is if the lead sign is positive. And this one over here at the lead sign is negative. It flips the graph upside down. Remember those transformations? All that fun stuff. And then odd degree polynomials are down on the left, up on the right if it's positive, up on the left, and down on the right if it's negative. And this is just talking about what happens as x goes to positive infinity or negative infinity. It doesn't say anything about relative to the origin. All right. And... We did a quick sketch last time, so I'll just do another quickie. If you have a function that is something like this, what is the degree of this polynomial? And be thankful I put it in factored form for you. Later in this chapter, we're going to have to factor things that look as ugly as this. Yeah. And it's not that bad. The degree is? Yeah. Four. Are you under cover? Jeez. Degree of this is four. And don't forget the negative in front. That's going to take it and flip it upside down. So right off the bat, we know that it's going to be the even degree polynomial both facing... Yeah. All right. What are the x-intercepts of this thing? Um, the book calls them zeros. And the only reason to call them zeros is if you say x-intercepts, you have to label them as coordinates. If you call them zeros, you only worry about the x-coordinate. But basically, they are the x-intercepts. So what makes this function equal to zero? Positive 3, negative 2, negative 4. And one more. Yeah. Nah, it wasn't zero. zero. If you let x equal zero, this whole thing becomes zero. So your zeros are three, negative two, negative four, and zero. But they are technically the same thing as x-intercepts because you're setting the entire function equal to zero. So if you see zeros, that also means uh, x-intercepts, just not as coordinates, just individual domain values. All right. So now we can kind of sketch a graph of this thing. doesn't have to be huge. You don't have to be precise with it. You don't have to mark it up or anything. You just have to locate the x-intercepts somewhat accurately. Like negative 4, I would put way over here. Um, what would be next? Negative 2, half the distance to the origin. 0 is the origin, and positive 3 someplace over here. So here's negative 4, negative 2, of course 0, and positive 3. All right. Now we know this graph is um, both down, right? So I know it's coming down that way, and I know it's going to end up going down that way. That's the end behavior of it. And then you, all you have to do is drag your way through this picture from left to right, realizing that the graph has to go through these zeros, through these x-intercepts. And how they're going to go through them is exactly what kind of function each one of these is. Each one of them is a linear <coughs> graph, so they're just going to go through the x-intercepts like a line. So it starts down here at negative infinity, and it's coming up, and it has to go through negative 4. Don't go too far, because then you'll be skipping over that negative 2. The second thing about polynomials is you have to remember that they're smooth and continuous, like a roller coaster, rolling hills, 
uh, things like that. So when I turn around and I have to come back to this negative 2, it's got to be a gentle turn. It can't be an instantaneous turn. So it's going to be this little bump. And once you make that turn, the graph has to go through negative 2, just like its little factor here, linearly. So it just goes through it. Don't go too far, though. Just get it on the other side of the axis, stop, and figure out what you're going to do next. The next point we have to go through is the origin. So I'm going to have to do a nice smooth turn to it, go through the origin, and then just stop right after you go through it. Don't go too far because that will mess up your picture. Um, and then I'm going to have to turn around again and go through 3. So gentle turn through 3. And if you hit the other arrow, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine. So you can just erase it afterwards. This is generally what this function looks like. Now there's a few things that you don't know. Number one, we don't know how high... Um, this relative maximum goes, or this one over here, and we don't know how low this relative minimum goes. And actually, one of those relative maxes is probably an absolute max, you know, the richest person in the whole world compared to the richest person in the neighborhood. To find those values, you'd have to take calculus, because there's no other nice way of finding it. And they're really not hard even with calculus. But this is generally what this picture looks like. It's a little upside down M or W, or depending on how you want to look at it. That's it. That's all there is to that graph. So what makes it harder? Well, these are all linear factors. What if I change it to be, well, something different? So let's look at two examples. What if I have g of x <coughs> is equal to x plus 3 squared, and I have h of x is equal to x minus 2 cubed? and look at their individual graphs. So what does x plus 3 all squared look like? Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, x plus 3 all squared. It's a, a parabola. It's a unit. Uh, what it does is its vertex. The most bottom point of the u. It's definitely not at the origin anymore. 3 where? Right? Left, up, down? Yeah. Left. Because it's positive 3 and it's inside parentheses, you go opposite direction. So you come over here, here's negative 3, and you get this picture. What I consider a bounce off of negative 3. So think of this as a bounce off of the 0. Now remember over here, the linear factors, they just went straight through because they wanted to behave like lines as they got close to these um, zeros of the function. When we're dealing with this thing, it's a quadratic. It's going to behave like a quadratic at its root, which is negative 3, and it's 0. All right, what about the other one? x minus 2 cubed, what does that kind of look like? It looks like the S snake thing, and it moves this way. To the right two units, so here's two, and the graph somewhat looks like this. And it kind of flattens out as it gets close to the root two. It comes down a little bit early, or comes up actually a little bit early, and then leaves it a little bit late. So it has this flattening effect as it goes through the zero. So what I call this is a leveling, or a level. levels off near the root. So if you have a linear factor, it goes straight through. If you have a quadratic factor, it bounces right off of the zero, depending on which direction it's coming from. And if you have a cubic factor, it's going to do a little leveling effect and then take off. So now we need to take all of these pieces and bring them together as one. So how would I graph f of x is equal to x plus 3 squared, x minus 2 cubed. Put it together as g of x times h of x. What would the graph of this thing look like? Well, first off, we need to find the degree. So what is the degree of this polynomial? 
you multiply it all out, what would be the highest power of x? It'd be 5, right? This one, if you expanded it all out, it would have an x squared in front. This one, if you expanded it out all out, it would have an x cubed in front. And then eventually you're going to have an x squared times an x cubed, which brings you to x to the fifth. So the degree on this thing is 5. Technically, it's just the sum of all the exponents. Same thing over here. 1, 1, 1, 1. If you add them all up, you get 4, the degree of the polynomial. All right, is it, uh, what's the end behavior on this thing? Both up, both down, one up, one down. Most well, positive lead coefficient, yeah. Up on the left, down on the right. Down on the left, up on the right. So this graph is coming from negative infinity, doing something near the origin, and then taking off to positive infinity as its range. All right. What are the zeros of this function? What are the zeros of this function? What makes it equal to zero? Zero does not make it equal to zero. Zero <laughs> makes it equal to nine times negative eight, negative 72. Negative three, negative three would make it equal to zero, and positive two would make it equal to zero. So negative three and positive two. Now we get into some fancy language. They're not individual roots. Negative three actually happens two times. So we say that this has multiplicity of 2. That means it actually happens two times because it's x minus 3 times x, I'm sorry, x plus 3 times x plus 3. Then this one must have multiplicity of 3 because it's a cubed, so it happens three times. Okay. Now, a multiplicity of 2 just tells you on your graph you're going to have a bounce. Multiplicity of 3 means you're going to have a leveling effect. If you have a multiplicity of 1, it's just going to be a line as you go through these roots. All right. So I only need to plot two x-intercepts, one of them at negative 3, someplace over here. There's negative 3. And someplace over here, positive 2. And I know my end behavior is down on the left, up on the right. So it kind of tells me the flow this graph is going to take as I move from the left to the right. All right. So as I come close to negative 3, how is it going to behave? Well, it's going to behave like the factor that it came from. And the factor it came from has a square in it. So it's going to have to behave like a bounce. It's going to be a parabola-type shape as you come in close to negative 3. So my suggestion for you is, as you're drawing this, come in early, hit the point, leave late. So it kind of flattens out as you go through it, and it bounces off of it. All right. After it comes from negative infinity, bounces off negative 3, it's going to come down, but eventually it has to come back up. But before I even get to it, I want to talk about what happens at 2. Well, the root 2, the 0, 2, comes from this factor this x minus 2 all cubed, so it's going to behave like the cubic. It's going to have that leveling effect. So again, you want to come in a little early and leave a little late. But the leveling still goes through, it's just a fancy going through. So when I come down here, I'm going to turn around, but I want to come in a little early to the 2, flatten out a little bit, and take off after it. And notice it ends up going in the same direction I thought it was going to. If you end up graphing something where your end behavior is not matching the graph you drew, you probably either forgot a bounce or something, more than likely a bounce, because that's the only one that forces it to go back to where it came from. So this is generally what the graph of f of x looks like. It has a little bounce, comes back up, levels off, and takes off to infinity. Not that hard, right? Kind of easy? Oh. So put a couple stars next to this one.
we can get our notation down. Given some function f of x is a continuous function on the interval a to b. Now our functions are going to be polynomial functions and they're guaranteed to be continuous on a uh, closed interval. Now remember this means from x equals a to x equals b on uh, uh, the domain. On the domain. Given f of x is continuous on a, b and f of a times f of b is less than zero. What the heck does that mean? Well, first off, remember a and b are x values. If I do f of a and f of b, what's f of a considered then? If a is an x value, f of a is a y value. So this is a y value times another y value. What's less than zero read in English? In English that people understand. Negative. negative. So this is saying the product of two y's is negative. What's the only possibility for the product for any two numbers to be negative? One's positive and the other one's negative. If they're both negative, it would become positive. So this is pretty much saying that these two are opposite signs. They're opposite signs. So it's a fancy way of saying that the two y values are opposite signs. So f of x is continuous on a closed interval. The product of their y coordinates is negative, so they have opposite signs. Then there exists some c on this. Now, What's the difference between bracket A and B and parenthesis A and B? One contains it. The top one contains A and B. The bottom one does not contain A and B. So the top one's called a closed interval. The bottom one is called a open interval. So it's not C is starting at A. It literally means C is somewhere between A and B. So this fancy thing says C is between x equals a and x equals b. Somewhere in between them. It cannot be a and it cannot be b. Because if it was a or b, then this thing would equal zero. But we'll get to that in a second. There exists some c, and not necessarily just one of them. It could be many of them, but we're only going to be looking for one. There exists some c on that open interval such that f evaluated at c is equal to zero. This is a fancy say, way of saying that x equals c is a zero of f of x. You're going to see a bunch of theorems in this chapter, and you have to know pretty much what they mean. You don't have to recite them verbatim or anything like that, but you have to understand what they mean. Now, as you read through this, it makes absolutely no sense. So I do a graphical picture, too. And it's actually the proof of it in a weird way. Um, it's not a technical proof, but it's an understandable proof for most people. We have a graph. Here's A. Here's B. We have a continuous function so that, let's say, f of A is positive. So this coordinate up here is A comma f of A. And down here we have to make the one opposite sign, so we want it to be negative, B comma f of B. Remember, the y values product is negative. So f of a is positive because it's above the x-axis. f of b is negative because it's below the x-axis. Okay. Now, remember, f of x is a continuous function. That means once I start drawing, I cannot pick up my pencil. So I have to draw from a f of a to b f of b without picking up my, well, in this case, my marker. The easiest way to draw the graph connecting those two points is what? A line. Yeah. Let's do it with a line. If I draw it with a line, does the green graph cross the x-axis between A and B? Yeah. So that kind of satisfies the whole condition of this, this theorem. <laughs> that picture there shows you that this value C is between A and B and it is a zero of the function because it's an x-intercept. Is that the only way of connecting those two points? What else can you do? Well, you can do a little wiggly line. 
long as it stays a function, but it doesn't change it, c would still be between a and b. So is there a way of drawing it so c is not between a and b? Disproving our theorem, but still being a continuous function. Yeah. Go outside the bounds, right? So you start up here, and you draw this direction. Why is the blue one illegal? I mean, if it was legal, then the whole theorem is crap, and you could throw it all away. So the blue one better be wrong. Why is it wrong? Well, it's definitely not between A and B. The x-intercept would be over here. But what's wrong with the blue graph? Remember, f of x is a function that is continuous on the closed interval A to B. It's not a function. It doesn't pass the vertical line test. It's it twice. So... If you're going to connect A and B with a continuous function, the x-intercept has to be between A and B, because anytime you go outside of it, you don't even have a function. So this is kind of a semi-proof. It's not the proof that you see in math books, but it's one that people understand. All right, so that's basically all it means. If you have a point above the x-axis and a point below the x-axis, and we're talking about a polynomial function, there's an x-intercept between those two x-values. There has to be. And that's called the Intermediate Value Theorem. And yes, you need to know it. It'll save your life sometimes. Uh, you can abbreviate it. You can say, by the IBT. By the IBT, there must be an x-intercept. So, for example, let's see if I can find a nice function. Uh, a polynomial function that looks like x squared, 6x squared minus 35x plus 50. And I'm interested if it has a 0 on the closed interval 2 to, well, the open interval 2 to 3, but I'm going to close the interval 2 to 3 for the beginning of the theorem. <coughs> now, similar to um, the average rate of change of a function, I'm giving you an interval to look at. These are both x values, right? You know, this is basically saying that x is equal to 2 and x is equal to 3. So what do you do? Stare at it. Next thing. I tell you what x is equal to. You really should be curious about y. Anytime you're given an x and you're not given a y, you always want to find its matching pair. If I give you a y, you always want to find a x, so you can have the matching pair. So plug in 2. So you get p of 2 is equal to 6 times 2 all squared minus 35 times 2 plus 50. Now, we're not a calculator, since we don't use those. <laughs> this is 24 minus 70 plus 50, so this is 4. So. so p of 2 is equal to 4. All right. What about p of, what was the other number, 3? So that would be 6 times 3 all squared minus 35 times 3 plus 50. This is uh, 54 minus 90, 105 plus 50. That's 104 minus 105, this is negative 1. So what does that tell me? Well, first off, f of x is a continuous function on this interval because it's a polynomial, so it's guaranteed to be continuous. And I have f of a times f of b is negative. I mean, look at it. If I do p of 2 times p of 3, p of 2 is equal to 4, p of 3 is equal to negative 1, and that's definitely less than 0. So it's met all of the conditions up to <coughs> here, the then. So it's met that f of x is continuous, and the product of their two y values is less than 0. So the rest of it must be true. There exists a c on the open interval, or a c between a and b, such that it is a 0 of the function. So now we can say, therefore, Short way of uh, saying therefore is a triangle of dies. Therefore, 
there is a C on the open interval 2 to 3. In other words, there is a number between 2 and 3 where f of c is equal to 0. Okay. What would you guess as a solution? 2.5. That would be most people. You don't go halfway. So what you could do then is take 2.5, plug it into the function, find out if it's positive or negative, and either squeeze it between 2 and 2.5 or 3 and 2.5 and get a smaller interval. If you have a graphing calculator, this is exactly what it does to solve um, graphs. Have you ever done that in a graphing calculator in high school? You know, you choose a point below the x-axis, you choose a point above the x-axis, and then you take a guess, and the calculator calculates out where it crosses the x-intercept. You ever did that? That's kind of fun. But it does the same process. It finds intervals, and it cuts it into half until it squeezes in on the true value. So it's kind of a neat theorem. So I would guess 2.5 might be a 0, or at least close to it. A little closer than 2 or 3, maybe. You never know. But that's how the intermediate value theorem works. It's kind of a very nice theorem. Ah, still have time. All right. We're not going to finish the next section, but I'm at least going to start it. Uh, let's get rid of this. This is three, three.